going to do some work in the Old Testament, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, I do believe. 1 Kings chapter 12. We often talk about it. every time I teach the Old Testament, I quote 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now go figure, it comes from the New Testament is where the quote comes from. We're fixing to teach in the Old Testament. Now these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. You ever go into a church and they tell you they don't believe in the Old Testament, they don't teach it, you might want to walk back out the door. Because I want to tell you something, you can teach the New Testament from the Old Testament. The Old Testament stories, and they're not just stories, now this happened to people. Or to us to apply their situation to our lives for something that's going on with us. And there are several, several examples set in the scripture. Um, I guess the past two, three weeks during my study and, and things, I, God always gives me a witness of something He wants me to teach. And I've often brought in the two golden calves. And I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of it. Some of you may not have heard of it. But it kept coming up and kept coming up. And I finally wrote it down to my wife. I said, I don't know why the Lord wants me to teach about these two golden calves. And of course, there's so much more going on in the scripture than the two, the two golden calves. And of course, as always, I will relate it to this, how we can apply it to our lives today and what's going on in the world today. There is so much, there is more prophecy in the Old Testament concerning the end times than there are in the New Testament. The New Testament is mostly about things that have already come to pass. That's what makes the Old Testament so very, very important. I don't want to scream in your ear now, so if I get too loud, you might want to say something. So, to kind of give you what's going on here, King Solomon has died in the, in the previous chapter. And his son is Rehoboam. Um, and I will tell you that he's about 20 or 21 years old. Is, is, if you could imagine a 20 or 21 year old young man fixing to be the king over all of Israel. Alright, but also the prophet Ahiah, the Lord had, had come to Jeroboam and told him that he was going to be the king of Israel. Alright, well when Solomon found this out, he wanted to kill him because God had anointed him to be king. Alright, so this is where we're going to pick this story up in verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Now his father was already the king over the whole house of Israel, which you had Judah and Benjamin, then you've got the ten northern tribes over here, and they're supposed to be united. Okay? So now Solomon has died, and they want Rehoboam to be the king over both Judah and Israel. Alright? <clears throat> Verse 2, And it came to pass when Jeroboam the son of Nebuch, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of the king Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. Now Jeroboam was told by Ahiah, who God sent to tell him he would be the king of Israel. So when Solomon found out, he fled to Egypt because he wanted to kill him. Well, now he's found that he's passed, so now he's going to come back and try to take his rightful uh, seat on the throne. <clears throat> Alright, verse 3. That they, they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Jeroboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. Now it's really a pretty fair request. Now old King Solomon had quite the appetite for building buildings and building his empire off the backs of the ten tribes of Israel. Alright? So he also had an appetite for many different women from many foreign places that worshipped false idols and did evilness in the sight of God, which is what caused him his kingdom to start with. Okay? So anyway, so the people are coming to him saying, hey, your, your father has put a heavy yoke on us. I mean, we're tired of being taxed to death. We're tired of, of do, doing all these buildings and doing all the work while y'all are y'all are sitting back and collect. Now, is that taking place today? It's not the government oppressing us today. Do you know, I don't know for whoever's got full-time jobs or not, or this, that, the other, but the government is almost taking half. Almost taking half of our hard-earned money. 
And if they were using it where they should be using it, it would be one thing. But they're not. When they can afford private jets and, and going here and there and all the money they spend, hey, the yoke is heavy on the working class people, and I will even go as far as say the working class people are the people that love the Lord and worship and praise Him because we are taught to work. Right? So we are also under oppression under that same yoke today as Solomon did for the ten tribes of Israel. So they have come and said, look, you lighten our taxes, take some of this workload off of us, and we will serve thee for the rest of thy days, is what the ten tribes are saying to him. And I also want you to keep in mind that he's kind of a long ways from home now. He's right in the heart of the territory of the ten tribes. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 5. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, and then come to me again. And the people departed. So he wanted to think about it. And the thing I find funny about people who have a lot of money and, and are evil, they like to use their influence to buy friends. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Alright, so he wanted a couple days to think about it. Verse 6, And the king Rehoboam consulted with the old men and stood before Solomon his father while yet he lived and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? Alright, so he makes a pretty smart move here. These are the elders that served <laughs> under his father who have life experiences, who have seen hard times or fallen on hard times, who have worked hard. So this was a smart decision of him to go to these elders and ask. And I ask you, who are you consulting today with your hard problems? Okay, I'm going to touch on that just a little bit more. I'm not done with this yet. Okay, so he's... All right, let me see here. I lost my place. All right, verse 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, and then will be thy servants forever. All he has to do is what the people asked him to do. It was not an unreasonable request. Okay? Verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. Now, so he forsook the counsel of the elders who have these life experiences, who have knowledge. Again, who are you consulting with today about your problems? And then, once you consult God about your problems today, and you pray about it, and then He gives you the answer, but you don't like it. So then what do you do? You reject the counsel of God, and you go do it your own way, and then things don't turn out too good for you, because they never do, and then who do you blame because it didn't work out for you? God. Now, also I have to make the point do you seek counsel from ungodly people? You think about old Job and his three knucklehead friends that didn't know the Lord, didn't know the Lord's word or anything, right? And he kept listening to them and kept listening to them and lost everything he had simply because he did not turn to the face of God. You cannot seek counsel from ungodly people and expect things to turn out good for you. So now, the reason I'm looking at this is he rejected the counsel of the elders. Now here you have this snot-nosed 20, 21-year-old kid pretty much being made the king over Judah and Benjamin. And now, he, and now he's going to be king over or wants to be the king over Israel. He rejects the counsel and goes to his buddies who he hangs out. If you want to put it in today's terms, he's out there hanging out with his buddies that he grew up with. Right? Never had to work a day in their life. Never had to suffer any hardship. Never had to see the Great Depression or go through World War I or World War II. Definitely not seeking the counsel of God. There are kids that go to high school today. I see them drive trucks that I can't. I, I, I probably will never even build before them when I get and I've worked all my life. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wealth when it's a blessing from God. But my point is, these young men have sat back and lived a nice, cushy life and mommy and daddy has bought each and everything from them. They've never had to work in the day of their life. they got all their nice clothes while the ones being oppressed had done all the work so that they could live their cushy lives. 
So this is who he's going to take and seek counsel from is these boys that have had not one bit of life